For nearly 2,000 years, Jews and Christians have been divided. But now, God is calling for the healing of past hurts and the comforting of His people. Discover how God is prophetically uniting Jews and Christians across the world today on The Crossover. Shalom, and welcome to our show, The Crossover, a show aimed at bridging gaps between Jews and Christians. Today we have a very special show for you and a special guest. Pat Robertson, the founder of CBN and 700 Club, is here as the main speaker for a fundraiser, a charitable dinner here in Houston at the Hyatt Regency for Vision for Israel and Joseph Storehouse. Stay tuned and you will learn about this wonderful ministry and the importance of helping the Jews in the diaspora and in Israel. Enjoy. But in 1974, I was there around Christmas time. I had a group of people with me and I had a chance to interview then Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. And it was Christmas, you know, the Jews don't celebrate Christmas in case you missed that. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we could get an interview with the Prime Minister and we went over all the topics you normally do in a TV interview and at the end I got a sense of sadness that this was following the oil embargo when the nations of the earth had turned against Israel. Uh, Prince Faisal had decided he was going to use oil as a weapon and start an embargo that was devastating to the United States economy and to the rest of the world. And people were basically saying, uh, is it worth paying double for your gas in order to support some Jews over in Israel? I didn't feel that, but that was the sentiment going on. It was a terrific anti-Israeli feeling, which was engendered by the Arabs. And as I was talking and concluding that interview with Yitzhak Rabin, uh, I said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, if you have a message that you'd like to deliver to the American people, what would it be? And he thought for a minute and he said, be strong, be strong. And you know, that's the heart cry of these smaller nations around the world, especially our friends like Israel, is be strong. Anyhow, that evening I, I got up to the uh, Intercontinental Hotel where we were staying, and if you've ever been there, it's on the Mount of Olives, and it overlooks the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and they have great big picture windows on so the dining room, an enormous floor-to-ceiling picture window, and you can look down, and here's the beautifully illuminated Temple Mount. And I told the people that story of the interview I had that afternoon or that day when I were uh, with the Prime Minister, and the sense of isolation he felt, the fact that the nations of the earth were against him and really Israel was all by itself, except for its friendship with the United States, and I might add with evangelicals. And as I related that story, I went ahead and I made a solemn vow to that group and I made a solemn vow to God that whatever happened in the world, however painful it may be, whatever it might cost, that I and the organizations I had would stand with the Jewish people and we'd stand with Israel. You ask yourself, well, why? You're a Baptist. How come you support <laughs> Israel? What is it? Well, why do evangelicals in America support Israel? Well, if you look at the economic picture, you see that Israel is the only democracy in a sea of tyranny. There isn't a, an independent uh, country in that whole region. They're all dictatorships or monarchies or what have you. Israel's the only bastion of democracy. It is a Western outpost. It's also a bastion of what you would call more modernity in the midst of a sea of Wahhabi uh, thugs who were trying to take the world back to Arabia of the 8th century. And you say, well, that's nice. But we stand for Israel on a much deeper level than that. You see, 
Abraham is our spiritual father. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our patriarchs. And David is our hero. And Isaiah and Ezekiel and the other prophets are our prophets. And more than anything, our Lord and Savior is a Jew who entrusted his message to 13 other Jews to take it to the world. And our allegiance transcends economics and it transcends politics. It is deeply felt, it comes from the heart, and it's not something you turn off or on uh, depending on what happens in the currents of, of the world. And it's not going to be popular because what we see right now is a vicious rise of anti-Semitism throughout the world, especially in France. I have little or no regard for France, even if you're fr Francophiles like Kerry, I am not one of them, you know. <laughs> And I, but when you see the anti-Semitism that's coming out of France, it is simply appalling. But it's not just France, it's Germany, and it's, it's some of the other countries in the East Bloc, and it's arising in, in, in England and other parts of the world. And the United Nations, I just uh, finished uh, reading a book by the former Israeli ambassador to the uh, UN, Dory Cole Gold. It was called The Tower of Babel. Not Babel, Babel. And he pointed out that that's what it amounts to is a bunch of babble that's going on up there in New York all the time. And they spend a good part of their deliberations attacking Israel. Do you remember Zion is, uh, Zionism is racism? A big bait, a debate in the General Assembly. And there have been a number of sanctions against Israel. Israel puts up a fence to protect itself from suicide bombers. The UN passes a, rebel, a resolution condemning it. And if it were not for the vote of the United States of America, it would have passed and there would have been sanctions against Israel for trying to protect itself. That organization is terribly one-sided. And as I look at the economic, uh, excuse me, the, the geopolitical uh, situation that's facing the world, uh, I've been enough, I've, I've flown in a helicopter up the border of Israel, I've flown in a helicopter with Uzi uh, Landau uh, that followed that fence and saw uh, how close it is. There are Arab villages, I don't know, if you get in the helicopter you can see it, there are Arab villages that are on hills literally looking down at the approach to the uh, uh, Ben Gurion airport, which is the main airport in Israel. In other words, anybody who had locations there with a mortar or any kind of equipment could shell the Israeli airport. And the thought that the Palestinians would have a sovereign state with the implements of sovereignty enabling them to bring in weapons of mass destruction freely without any interference whatsoever from Israel. You know, they tried to, to, to smuggle in 50 tons of, of high explosive weapons and other kinds of rockets and, and uh, uh, missile launchers. Uh, if the Israelis hadn't caught them doing it, they would have installed those uh, in their country. But if there's no check whatsoever Israel will be under attack. The, 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 the neck of, of Israel along what's called the West Bank is only nine miles. It's, it's uh, uh, and, and when you go to, to uh, they talk about settlements, when you go to Bethlehem, it, it's like a suburb. Uh, it was, you know, like if you know Dallas and Fort Worth, it's, it's, Bethlehem is closer to Jerusalem by far than Fort Worth is to Dallas. It's right there. And they call that a settlement. And, and uh, if the Palestinians who are intent on the destruction of Israel are that close, then the entire stability and in, uh, well, the coherence of Israel will be uh, deeply, deeply compromised. You know, the telephone rang, and I had a security guy with me, and he says, there's a phone call for you. And I said, there he is, who is it? I said, it's Yasser Arafat. I said, okay, well, hello. <laughs> You know, yeah, sir, what's on your mind? And uh, he says, can you come see me? 
And I said, look, I've got a plane I've got to catch tonight. Uh, I'm leaving at one o'clock in the morning for New York. Uh, I've got to drive up to the airport to uh, tell me to get on board a plane. And I said, how do I get to Bethlehem? And he said, oh, we will arrange it. Well, yeah, sure. So it was like something out of a spy novel. Uh, <clears throat> we drove in a dark car up a little dark alley, got out of this Israeli car with Israeli plates, got into a car with Palestinian plates, backed out of this dark alley, and drove off into the night past several security checkpoints into Manger Square in Bethlehem, which was an armed camp. There were people everywhere with Uzis and uh, uh, AK-47s and other types of automatic weapons. And I was taken into this um, former monastery and went up steps and along each level, it was like a barracks with all these troops in there sleeping uh, with their weapons, went all the way up stairs and uh, here's this room with this enormous, it was a room that was bigger than this, with an enormous picture of Jesus at one end of it. And sitting on a chair at the other end was none other than Yasser Arafat. And uh, for the life of me, I don't know what he wanted to talk about, but I had a camera with me, so we, we talked about something. And his main thing, that he wanted to snow me on the fact that he wanted peace with Israel, and he was such a good guy. And uh, I, yeah, I talked for a little while, I looked at my wife, and I said, well, look, thanks a lot, I've got to go back, uh, get on a plane. Oh, well, thank you for coming. And so, you know, he. But the truth is, Yasser Arafat had one goal in mind, and that was the absolute destruction of Israel. And people have to understand, if they know anything about the Middle East, is that the fanatic Muslims, and as a matter of fact, most of the Arabs have one thing in mind. When something belonged to them, they say it is the property of Allah and we must take back what belongs to Allah. They do not want Israel to have one square inch of land in the Middle East. Make no mistake about it. And Arafat's goal was to have a, a progressive weakening of Israel. He would take a little bit, take a little bit, take a little bit, take a little bit until he got it all. And he knew if he had an independent state and he wanted Jerusalem, uh, half of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem as his capital. And if he had gotten that, then it would just been a question of time before he began the attack on the other part and he would never have been any peace. And when uh, uh, Ehud Barak made a deal uh, with them uh, under the urging of Bill Clinton and signed various agreements that set up that entire territory, and enshrined what was called the Oslo Accords, Barak made undreamed of concessions to the Palestinians. He gave them everything they had ever asked for. And Yasser Arafat said, it's not enough. We will not settle unless you grant us the right of return, which means every Palestinian who had any claim on any piece of property in Israel all the way back to 1948, and all of their children and their relatives would have rights to come down and, and possess that land in Israel, which would have meant there had been more Palestinians in Israel than Jews. And that was an untenable situation, and he knew it, and as a result, uh, he said, basically, if you don't give me what I want, and I'm quoting him directly, he says, to hell with you. And he started the Intifada, which has resulted in the death of at least 1,500 uh, Jewish lives, or maybe more than that. I don't have the, the total numbers, but it's been a shocking thing. And what they've done is clamp down on Israeli tourism, it's clamped down on the sources of income coming into Israel. They have tried to choke that country economically, in order to win a victory. And he has led to untold suffering uh, among his own people. He's led to untold suffering among the Israeli people. And so many young people have had their minds poisoned because they have been indoctrinated since the time they're barely weaned. Throughout all the early years of school, they've been taught nothing but hatred for Israel. And I think somebody has to have his brain addled if he thinks that somehow a couple of people are going to sit in at a table and sign a piece of paper and they're going to uh, 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 er er 
eradicate the hatred that has been built up during the uh, time of Yasser Arafat's reign uh, and the reign of the Palestinian Authority. That whole thing has got to be cleaned up. The terrorists have got to be done away with. But it seems like right now Hamas wants to make their problems. Uh, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade has now been called the Arafat Martyrs Brigade. Uh, the Fatah, the various other uh, organizations, and especially Hezbollah up in, up in Lebanon, uh, all want to get into the mix. And they do not want peace. They want to continue a, a, an armed struggle against Israel to destroy Israel. So here we are with people we love, here we are with people with whom we share a common bond and a common faith. We worship the same God. We believe in the same Bible. And we serve a Lord who is Jewish. And we say to the, our friends in Israel, despite the ravings of Wahhabi thugs, despite the rhetoric of the quartet, the United Nations, the Russians, the France, and the United States State Department, we are not going to forsake our friends in Israel. We are going to stand with you and we're going to main see that you maintain your territorial integrity come what may. I've been, had waited for many years. Those of us who are familiar with biblical prophecy knew there was one key prophecy we wanted to see fulfilled and that's where Jesus Christ said, Jerusalem will be trodden under foot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And we waited and waited and waited and waited. I had the Vice Mayor of Jerusalem on my show some years ago. He said, well, what's all this stuff about Jerusalem? Why are you so interested? I said, Don't you understand? Well, no, he didn't, but anyhow. Uh, it meant something very important in prophecy because in 1967, in the Six-Day War, when the Jews, or when the Israelis took over, uh, East Jerusalem, the first time since 586 BC, Israel was now in charge of all of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was no longer trodden under foot of the Gentiles. This was a major prophetic event. This is the time of the Gentiles, the end of the time of the Gentiles. In other words, there's been a tremendous revelation of God to the Gentile nations. Uh, it's like a time now uh, when the sun is setting over a body of water and, and you see it at that moment, it looks incredibly bright and intense. Uh, you know, it's up in the sky, you, you don't notice it as much, but it gets right there, you look right at it and it, it just gets in your eyes. We have had this kind of intensity in the last few years, certainly in the last uh, 10 years or so at CBN, for example, overseas and around the world, we have seen well over 300 million people come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's the kind of revival that's been going on. We're in the end of the time of the Gentiles, the revelation of God to the Gentiles. That is something that we wanted to see. Jesus said when Jerusalem is no longer trodden under the foot of the Gentiles, then the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And the Apostle Paul put it another way. Uh, if you read in Romans, he said, blindness in part has happened to Israel. Until the, you know, the Greeks have a wonderful language. They, they, they use what they call, we call onomatopoeia. The, 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 the word say something, you know. And the word in Greek that Paul uses is pleroma. It's a wonderful word, pleroma. It means fullness. Until the pleroma, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And then, Paul said, all Israel will be saved. There's going to be a great revelation of God to the Jewish people. And some here tonight are Messianic Jews, and you are the first fruits of what God is doing in the world today. It is the beginning of one of the great moves of God. And when this happens, Paul said, it'll be like life from the dead. It'll be like resurrection. When, the, when the, the revelation of God swings away from the major Gentile nations and swings back again to Israel, this is a key prophetic event. And we're watching the time clock ticking as we see more and more toward the end of the age. The other prophetic things we look for, of course, is Israel coming back in the land. 
coming back from Russia. You know, the Joseph Storehouse is taking care of some of these Russian Jews that are, that are coming in. Well, isn't that what the Bible says? That the people coming from the land of the north will exceed what came out of Egypt? And uh, he will say to the people of the north, come back, and they're coming back. They, they've been a, a great move of, of, of Jews from that part of the world into Israel in fulfillment of prophecy. But the, the, the nation will come back again and in the land. And God said, I will give you a pure language. A few years ago, I met with, with uh, uh, Ehud ben Yehuda, uh, who was the son of Eliezer ben Yehuda. And um, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you see Ben Yehuda Street. Uh, El El Eliezer was the man who, who uh, was the founder of modern day Hebrew. And Ehud told me, he said his father uh, saw a light and he heard a voice telling him to bring forth a pure language to his people. Well, that's what God, God had said was going to happen, that God was going to restore to the Jewish people a pure language. And he used this man to do it. And uh, it's amazing, uh, he and his wife uh, uh, were married, but uh, they did not cohabit on the ship because Eliezer says, I don't want to take the chance that our son, our first Hebrew speaking son is going to be born on some ship. He's got to be born in Israel. So we're going to wait till we get there to make sure. <laughs> and, uh, but he was talking about how he, he listed, he got the, uh, uh, instead of the Ashkenazi uh, uh, pronunciation that he got the Sephardic because he thought that was more melodious. And the people of Israel speak Hebrew today. And God gave them a language, a dead language. It is an evidence of God's work among these people. They've come back into the land. Jerusalem is no longer trodden underfoot of the Gentiles. There's a, a, a beginning of, of the stirring of faith among the, the Jewish people. And the other prophetic thing that is said about, that is certainly taking place now, is said in, Jer in Zechariah, that all the nations of the earth are going to come against Jerusalem. And so we're, we're seeing a point of time that, that, that says Satan is going to move against Israel. And I've asked myself, why do people hate the Jews so much? Did you ever think of that? Some of you are Jewish? Did you ever think? You know, somebody said, you know, I'm supposed to be chosen, but why did he choose me for this? <laughs> <laughs> the reason is, the Jew is the evidence of God's work on this earth. And if the devil can destroy the Jews, if he can keep them from coming back to Jerusalem, if he can keep them from coming back to Israel, if he can keep them from taking possession of, of uh, Jerusalem, then the prophecies will fail and Jesus won't come back again. That's the whole game. That's why there's such hatred of the Jews is because the devil himself has stirred in the Adolf Hitlers of this world and the others, uh, the anti-Semites, to turn against this. Why are we seeing this hatred of the Jews by their cousins, the Arabs. Why? Because the devil wants to destroy them from this land because if he could do that, then the fulfillment of God which says your kingdom is coming down won't happen. And that's why I'm, I, I mean, I'm all for President Bush. I just thank God he got elected and I'm thrilled that he's in there and all this other stuff. But if he sets his hand against Jerusalem, the Lord is going to set his hand against him, and I don't want to see that happen. You know, his daddy has some pretty bad things happen, but at Cunny Bump Court, well, when he, he made a deal over in Madrid to take land away from the Jews, and that very day, the perfect storm hit up there in New England, and God says, don't you touch these people. <laughs> you know, you do, I'm going to touch you. And uh, he tore his house up. We're living in the days before the coming of the Lord, and everything is starting to line up. But when you see these things happening, Jesus said, lift up your eyes because your redemption draws near. We are getting closer and closer to something really wonderful happening in our world. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that we're part of it. And this is all part of God's purpose. Because the Lord said to Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless those that bless you. And I'm going to curse those that curse you. And I am 
relatively certain one of the great reasons that God has blessed my organizations and it's plural as much as he has uh, since 74 is because we wanted to bless Israel. And I think when you stand with Israel and with the Jewish people, God says, I have a, 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 a timeless promise that I'm going to extend to you. I'm going to bless you. I'm Jim Becca. I've been a journalism teacher for many years. But one thing that upsets me a little bit, and this is what I teach my students, is that truth can never be bested by falsehood in the public arena. But what happens when so much of what you see in the media is not the truth, and it's overbearingly, blatantly bad, or anti-good? Anti and that's why I was really concerned. That's why I think that uh, the crossover can be a powerful instrument in reaching people because it's actually proclaiming the truth, the positive side of a lot of different things, and reaching out to people. Crossover exists to communicate to the Jewish community that there is a growing group of Christians who love them unconditionally. The focus of the Crossover program is to promote a greater understanding of the differences and similarities between Jewish and Christian customs, history and theology, while encouraging a closer walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. As a second-generation Holocaust survivor, Rosalie's Jewish heritage includes parents who were protected from the Nazis by Christians. Yet for more than a decade, Mitch and Rosalie searched for meaning in life in the New Age movement. But after returning to their Judeo-Christian roots, they discovered God's purpose for their lives, to rebuild bridges between Christians and Jews. Now through TV, radio, the internet, speaking engagements, the healing room, and print and video resources, they are reuniting Jews and Christians in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Join Mitch and Rosalie as they tackle tough topics and welcome dynamic guests on The Crossover. The Promised Land. And I also try to make it very clear to the Christians all over the world that they are threatened to the same extent as the Jews and Israel is, are threatened. Uh, and I also say basically that Jews and Christians are waiting for the Messiah, who is a Jew from Israel who speaks Hebrew. And that Messiah is going to come to Jerusalem. And so Christians share this faith with the Jews. The Hebraic roots of Christianity. And we begin looking at Jesus through Jewish spectacles and not our Texas spectacles or American spectacles. Mitch and Rosalie, as they reach an ever-growing worldwide audience through the crossover. We invite you to become a crossover partner right now by calling the number on your screen. For your monthly gift of $30 or more, you will receive the Crossover Partnership Pack, which includes a DVD of today's program, a personal greeting and prayer message from Mitch and Rosalie, and more information about the Crossover Project. As you continue to support the Crossover each month, you will receive a new Crossover DVD, plus a ministry report, and your name will be added to our healing room. Call now and join the growing family of Crossover Partners. And be sure to join us again next week as Mitch and Rosalie tackle timely topics and welcome dynamic guests on The